Nagato Kimura was in his office as a 30-foot high wall of water raced toward him. As tsunami sirens wailed, he ordered his workers to leave while he stayed behind to lock up. Moments later, the landscape of Ashinomaki, Japan, was completely surreal. Boats were tossed about like toys, cars were poached on top of houses, and everything changed in an instant. In that very moment, they started to notice that the factory that Kimura-san's father had built had been utterly destroyed. Now, as workers went through the beach, they began to start to see that these tiny cans dotted the landscape. They were covered in mud and debris. Now, people got word of this, and they actually decided to help out. So they traveled to Ashinomaki, they gathered up the cans, they cleaned them, and they transported them back to Tokyo. There's just one problem. How do you sell something in a store that has no label? The labels had been washed away. Well, one really surprising thing happened. People began coming into the stores and decorating each of the cans with messages of support and unity, like this one that says, help each other, Japan. As I spent time having canned mackerel with Kimura-san, he talked to me about the remarkable generosity of people, ordinary citizens that came together and gathered up 800,000 cans. Across Japan, they became known as Cans of Hope. 5,000 miles away, Orrin Johnson is a constitutional committee member of Iceland's new provisional government. Bankers there inflated a financial bubble that wrecked the national economy. In order to reestablish trust, the government listened to people, they built consensus, and they crowdsourced the first constitution of the new nation. Now, here you have two island nations, two catastrophes, two instances when people turned to the streets in rage and protest, and yet the ultimate resolution to crisis came from the opposite of anger. There's a growing shift in the values between masculine and femininity in the 21st century. We live in a world that's increasingly social, interdependent, and transparent. And in this world, feminine values are ascendant. Because we see the most innovative people among us are breaking from traditional structures to be more flexible, more nurturing, and more collaborative. This is what we call the Athena Doctrine, named after the Greek warrior, whose wisdom and civility guided the Greek mythology. In this context, we see people using their femininity in ways large and small to make the world a better place. Michael D'Antonio and I spent, he's my co-author, we spent uh, nearly two years surveying 64,000 people in 13 countries. We collected data from Canada to Chile, from US to Indonesia, we chose a broad array of countries that represented various political and economic diversity. But we also went around the world nearly four times talking to people everywhere. We spent time in the favelas of Peru and in the villages of northern India. We spent time with educators in Stockholm, startups in Tokyo, and CEOs in Shanghai. We actually got to spend time with world political leaders in Jerusalem and Brussels. And everywhere we went, we started to ask people questions about their life. What gives their lives meaning and what makes them happy? And when you talk to people today, it's almost as if we live in an age of extended anxiety. Many people question the future of their children. Other people are questioning whether or not there's too much power in the hands of, of businesses and institutions. We also see that there's this sort of directive around people, whether or not leaders are feeling like they are connecting and having empathy. And then lastly, we see that the, this question of the world's basic fairness. Now, when we look at these, what we tend to see underneath all this is a global referendum on men. In fact, the majority of people around the world <laughs> are dissatisfied with the conduct of men, right? This includes 79% of people in Japan and in South Korea, two-thirds of people in the US, Indonesia, and Mexico. Now, Canadian men must be doing something right, <laughs> as they have the lowest levels of dissatisfaction. But they're really the anomaly in our data. In fact, when we look at millennials, their views are actually the strongest on femininity and the role of women in society. 
three quarters of Japanese youth and South Korean youth, two thirds of youth nearly everywhere else in our study. And then we saw a very interesting thing, a double digit generational gap between millennials and men in places like South Korea and India. And we think what's behind this is this codes of male conduct are actually sort of coming under attack. Codes of control, aggression, black and white thinking that have led to many of the problems we face today, from reckless risk taking to income inequality, wars and scandal. In fact, when we looked at the data again, we actually see that two thirds of people around the world think the world would be a better place if men thought more like women. This includes 79% of men in Japan. 75% of adults in France and in Brazil. 72% of people in the UK. And in fact, when we looked at the millennial data yet again, we actually saw the views of millennials being stronger on this question than women in places like China and South Korea. So what would the world be like if we thought more like women? What does thinking like a woman mean? This is sort of a practical problem for me in that I am a man. <laughs> Michael, my co-author, and I are husbands and fathers in all female households, but this hardly requires, uh, stands up to empirical research. So we wanted to find a way to understand masculinity and femininity in a measurable way, engage the public's attitudes toward those traits. So we created two separate studies. In the first study, we went to our global sample and we talked to 32,000 people around the world, and we asked them to classify 125 different traits as either masculine or feminine or neither. Next, in the second and separate study, we asked those very same traits again to the other half of our sample, those 32,000 people, only this time there was no discussion of gender. We simply asked them, how would these traits relate to making the world a better place? We saw a lot of consistency around what people think are masculine and feminine, and we also saw some surprising facts that I'd like to share with you. The first thing we saw is that the essence of a modern leader is feminine, as preferred by people around the world. We seek a more expressive type of leader who shares their feelings and emotions more openly and honestly than in sort of closed power systems. We're also looking for a leader that plans for the future, that does long-term thinking rather than being politically expedient. We're also looking for leaders that are patient and reasonable, that can build consensus and get things done. Now, decisiveness and resilience are really important aspects of leadership, but so is collaboration and being patient and being passionate. And in fact, the, the idea that being proud was not sought upon as a strong leadership trait as related to being loyal is really the question around how we really seek our leaders. Are we running for ourselves, or are we running for a cause? Let's look at some examples of some of these Athena-style leadership. We spent time with Jonas Vig and Mans Alder. They've created the first live technology video broadcasting platform in Stockholm. Basically, what they're out to do is correct divisive dictatorial leadership in places like Egypt, where their technology was broadcast by youth from Tahir Square. We also spent time with Dr. Ayed Maddish, whose vulnerability is upending science. As he told me, he started to get stuck in his experiments, and when he went to his colleagues for help, he realized that it's taboo to ask for advice in scientific medical research. So he decided to create ResearchGate. This is a social network for scientists. So far, ResearchGate has 200 members in 200, 2 million members, 200 million members in 20, 200 different countries. We also spent time with Major General Orna Barbavai. She's the highest ranking woman in the Israeli Defense Force. When I asked her how she approached military strategy, she said, as the perspective of a mother. She said that mothers can see various angles on consequences on situations and can adjust and take action before they do so. She also talked about the importance that strength is the essence of restraint and that women can actually de-escalate conflict. 